Good morning. Happy Sabbath. What a blessing it is to be in God's house one more time. Happy New Year to you. Happy, happy New Year. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. It is a glorious time to be in God's house today. For in God's house, there are many, many blessings. And with the new year, there are all kinds of goals and resolutions that we make. But if there's one resolution that I hope that you have made for this new year, is that you plan and purpose in your heart to get closer to God. Spend more time in his word. Spend more time fellowshipping with like-minded believers and witnessing to a lost and dying world. God has given us so many people that we can share the good news of Jesus Christ with. And that, I hope, will be the resolution on your heart. Well, we are at a new time. And we thank you for staying with us and joining us at our new time this week. Not just for this week, but moving forward. We have begun our in-person Sabbath school right here in our sanctuary. We've always had in-person Sabbath school. They've been in various classrooms around our campus. But we have brought our members back to the sanctuary for in-person Sabbath school and we want to say welcome back into the sanctuary. So come on out if it is your desire to study your lesson and to fellowship with one another right here. Then please come on back and join us for our in-person Sabbath school. That starts at 9 a.m. From 9 a.m. to 9.50 a.m. is our in-person Sabbath school. And then... Lagos University will start at 10.05. So we thank you for your, your fellowship with us right here on Lagos University. Now, I want you to do something for me. I want you to press like, share, and subscribe because that helps us to continue to get the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. And when we do that, we become digital disciples for Jesus for we are in a world that is dying daily. There are so many things that are going on in this world that they need hope. And we know that our hope lies in Jesus. And so with the new year, there is a new quarter. And so the lesson study that we have for this quarter is managing for the master till he comes. Managing for the master Till he comes. And you can secure your copy from your Sabbath school superintendent, from your Sabbath school teacher, or from your local Adventist bookstore. If you are not able to get to any one of those, do not despair. They are online to any one of the Seven Day Adventist sites where you can download your copy weekly and you can be a part of the lesson study discussion. And so we're going to go into our song service this morning. And our song service is being brought to us by Elder Eugene Richardson. And he is accompanied by Sister Simone Otterbridge. Lift up your voices loud. Let them ring. Jesus is coming again. Join in with us. Elder Richardson, Sister Otterbridge, take us to the throne room of God. Our first song is number 206, Face to Face with Christ my Savior. Number 206. Face to face with Christ my Savior. Face to face, what will it be? I behold 
him, Jesus Christ, who died for me. Face to face shall I behold him, far beyond the starry sky. Face to face in all his glory, I shall see him by and by. Only faintly now I see him with the darkening veil between. But a blessed day is coming when his glory next song is number 529. 529, under his wings I am safely abiding. 529. Safely 
what precious enjoyment there will I hide till life's trials are o'er. Sheltered, protected, no evil can harm me. Resting in Jesus, I'm safe evermore. Under his wings, under his wings, who from his love can sever. Under his wings, my soul shall abide, safely abide forever. Amen, amen, amen. We want to thank you, Elder Richardson, and Sister Otterbridge for your ministry in song this morning. Safely abiding under God's wings forever. Isn't that such a reassurance that no matter what, no matter where, no matter what's going on, we know that we can abide under the almighty covering of Jesus Christ, where there is safety, where there is love, where there is peace, where there is some compassion, and there is joy. Thank you so much for your ministry in song this morning. Well, we are going to go right into our lesson study discussion for this morning, and we are going to meet our panel and then we're going to get right into our lesson. We do not want to waste one moment. We've had our in-person Sabbath school, and they were, they, they were warming up. Okay. They were warming up, panel. I just want to let you know, they were warming up. They have set the tone for what's coming here for our Lagos panel this morning. They have set the tone. And so I want to say good morning, good morning, good morning to the panel. We have on the panel with us this morning, Brother Delvion, you're back. It is good to see you. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Good morning, happy Sabbath. It's good to be back as well. Amen, amen, amen. And Elder Mark, it is good to see you in your spot this morning. Yes. Happy morning. Sabbath and happy New Year. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, happy, happy Sabbath, happy New Year to everyone that's listening today. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen, amen. And we have back with us Elder Jamal Oboy. Good morning, good Elder morning. Oboy. It is good to see you <laughs> in your spot this morning. Uh, good morning, good morning. Happy Sabbath, happy new year to everyone. It is good to be back. Amen, It is good amen. to be back and be a part of this panel discussion. Uh, managing for the Master. Yes. Looking forward to it. Amen. Uh, happy new year to everyone and Happy Sabbath as well. Amen, amen. And so there you have it, folks, our panel for this quarter so far. And the lesson study for today, lesson one, part of God's family, part of God's family. Now, when you look at that title of being a part of God's family, I want to know, write it in the chat for me. What does that mean right there, being a part of God's family? Because I know for some of us, we may not feel a part of the biological families that we were born into. Mercy. For some people, they may not know who their families really are. Mm. They may have all kinds of things about their family. They may not even want to claim the family Mercy. that they are mm, in. Mm. But I want you to tell me in the chat right here in the sanctuary, what does that mean to be a part of God's family? And so our panel is going to take us into our lesson study discussion this morning. And we're going to have Elder Mark open us up with our prayer for this morning. And then our abled moderator in the person of our head elder, Elder Joswan Smith, will take us into our lesson study discussion for this morning. Our mic is in the middle of the floor. Please Join us with your questions and comments. Elder Mark? Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this Sabbath day. We ask, Lord, that you pour and give us a quadruple portion of your Holy Spirit upon this lesson. 
Dear Lord, we ask that hearts may be blessed and minds changed in the name of the Lord. This is my prayer in Jesus' name that God's people say, amen. 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 Enjoy amen. the lesson study discussion for this morning. Good morning, good morning, and happy Sabbath to every one of you out there. We're so glad that even though we've changed our time, I get to see so many of you still here on the chat. Brother Kevin Mallory right here with us. He's on here. Sister Ramshurn and, and Donna Rodney and Marion James and Ethelyn Ewers, Macy Hollensheed and Sister Libby Bird Nelson and Michael Pohl and Jacqueline Rush, Donna Davis and Audrey Richards and uh, uh, Ignatius Gussie, and, and Brother Gussie, I don't know why, but this morning when I woke up, you were on my mind, and I had a prayer for you, so I, I, I pray that God blesses you. I don't know you, but Brother Gussie, you were on my mind this morning, and God bless you. Now, we're going to get right into our lesson this morning, part of God's family. Now, I have to admit, I was a little bit nervous about this particular uh, uh, quarter, quarterly, because it says, managing for the master till he comes. And I know that I have some struggles in the financial area. <laughs> and I said, oh no, now God's gonna start <laughs> giving me something to think about. But I'm grateful, I'm grateful for this lesson. And I'm glad that he started off by letting us know that we're a part of his family. And if you're a part of his family, then there are certain, a certain lifestyle, a certain way that we ought to have to be a part of his family, amen? Mm -hmm. Amen, so we're amen. gonna get right into this memory text. And I thought it was very interesting as I looked at this memory text, uh, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1, and it says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Now, I looked up this word bestowed, and it's a Hebrew word, didomi, didomi. This word bestowed means, means to give something to someone of one's own accord to his advantage. God has given us his love of his own accord to our advantage. Mm -hmm. And it goes on to say, to give one, to give one to someone to whom he already belonged to return. Mercy. What manner of love God has bestowed. He has brought us back unto himself, given us to himself, given himself to us, mm -hmm. and we already belonged to him. Mm -hmm. And yet he's returning us to himself. What manner of love God has bestowed on us. The children of God have the character of God. The children of God have the character of God. If we don't have the character of God, can we rightly be the children of God? Mm -hmm. Mercy. If we don't accept this love, this great love that he's bestowed upon us, can we be the children of God? So we are entrusted to carry on his work in taking care of what he left us. And don't we do the same with our own children? Huh? Don't we do the same when we die? Don't we expect them to, 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 to build on what we've left them? Don't we expect them to take care of everything we've left them? Including, including the character that we've helped them to have as they grew up. We want our children to represent us well. And I say that God expects the same. That he has gone back to heaven to finish a work for us. But while we're here, while we tarry here, he expects us to take care of everything he's left, he's left us. Not just the physical things, but 
ourselves as well. Mm -hmm. That goes from the spiritual to the mental to the emotional to the physical, everything. And he's left us instructions on how to do it. So brothers and sisters, I, as I'm, I'm looking forward to getting into this lesson because our very bodies belong to God. He's left us here to take care of our very own, the very bodies we walk around in. Amen? Mm -hmm. Amen. So this lesson is going to be deep. So as we get into Sunday's lesson, out of Mark, we take us into Sunday's lesson, Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, 27, and 29. We're going to take it from the ESV. Galatians 3, 26, 27, and 29. We are part of God's family. It reads, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. You are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Mm -hmm. Amen, amen. Take us into this lesson. We are, it's a statement. I don't see a question mark when you mm. read that. We are part of God's family. Take us into Sunday's lesson. We are part of God's family. Not many people know this, but I have an older brother. And he's much older than I. And he used to visit us a lot when we were little. And he considered us family, even though we had different mothers. Mm. He considered me family because we had the same daddy. Mm. We had the same father. The first truth in this lesson is that we are part of God's family because we have the same father. The prodigal son, he did a pack of nonsense and when he came back to his, to his father, his other brother, the prodigal son's brother was upset. He said, why are you having a feast? And the father said, we are this, of the same family. We have the same father. Ellen G. White points out in Desire of Ages, pages 832, the family of heaven yes. and the family of earth are one. The prodigal son's brother can, in a sense, represent the heavenly family, and the prodigal son can represent the earthly family. We have the same father. The angels in heaven, they're, they're watching, they're going over the books, the judgment books, and they're seeing whether or not we're gonna, who's, why is this person named in the book of life? And what they're gonna see is that my blood my blood was shed for you. The same Father, if you turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Forgive me, I'm going to turn to the, my word. <laughs> for this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named the father of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have this same father. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, the Lord teaches us when we pray to say, Our Father, hallowed be thy name. It's our Father. He's saying that we have the same daddy. When Mary Magdalene, Magdalene in John chapter 20, verse 17, she wanted to, after Jesus' resurrection, she wanted to embrace Jesus. And Jesus said to her in John chapter 20, verse 17, do not cling to me, for I have not ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. We have the same relative. We have the same father. We are one family. And the second truth in this lesson I found is that those that are not in Christ have different fathers. John chapter 8, verse 44 to 45 says, 
ye are of, the, of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and a bird not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of, of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Those that are not in Christ have different fathers. That's why when Jesus comes again, he can say, many will say unto me, Lord, Lord, have I not done this? Lord, Lord, have I not done this? And Jesus will say, I never knew you. You were not part of the family. You were not part of my family. He will say to them, in, in essence, your father tried to kill me many times. And you sided with him. The final truth in Sunday's lesson that I want to share with you is that not only are we part of God's family, but God loves us. Mm. That, that text, John 3, 16, anyone can memorize it. All of us know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In conclusion, not only does God exist, but he loves you. And he wants to relate to us in a loving manner. He wants to relate to us in such a way that family often used in scripture is used to depict this perfect relationship. God calls Israel my people. He calls Abraham a friend of God. He calls you son of God, and he refers to God as our father. The final text that I want to share with you, if I may go back to my, my word again, the scriptures. Galatians chapter 3, 26. For ye are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, nor bond nor free, nor black nor white. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ. And if ye be in Christ, then ye are of Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And I want to end with this final point that I just noticed. Isaiah chapter 43, 1 to 2 says, For I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by name. Thou art mine. Um, a joke, you know, the, the bottom line is this. God loves us the way family members are supposed to love each other. Amen, amen. I appreciate that. But think about this. In terms of family, I'm glad that God even uses this analogy and compares it to family. The problem with us is that we, because of sin, have totally messed up this concept of what family means. Self is always put ahead of everybody else. But family, just by virtue of it being a family, means that self must be put away. And if anybody in this place is a father, you know what, and I mean mothers too, but I'm gonna stick to the fathers today. You know what it's like to sacrifice self for your family, your dreams, your things you like. You, you sacrifice it so your family can have. But you know what, how many of us, I like this thing, the family of, of heaven and the family of earth are one. But how many people have experienced having a sibling or someone in a family and you question, were they brought up in the same house as me? Mercy, mercy. My goodness. They are so completely opposite from what we've been taught. It's not funny, right? <laughs> and I'm sure that's how the angels see us. My goodness, were these people got the same daddy as me? Because they be crazy. You know what I mean? But we're going to move on to Monday's lesson. We, we got to really go through quickly. Monday's lesson out of old boy. And you can make your point all through there. First, First Chronicles 29, verses 13 and 14 in the NIV. Take us quickly there. God is the owner of everything. Sure, because the Bible says, Now our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people? that we should be able to give as generously as this. Mm. Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. And before I jump real, really quickly back into Monday, I just want to highlight, it was a point um, in Sunday's lesson, 
that talk about the, the family structure and how we are to conduct ourselves as family because there's another aspect of family that says that families, a family is a group of people that believe in the, uh, that have the same convictions or common affiliations. Mm. So in essence, we are a family because we believe in certain doctrinal beliefs and, and the like, right? So the lesson says, God calls for a change among his people. Union with Christ and with one another is our only safety in these last days. And then she jumps on to say, behold, I'm sorry, let us not make it possible for Satan to point to our church members saying, behold, how these people standing under the banner of Christ, this is important, hate one another. Mercy. Mercy. We have nothing to fear from them. This is Satan talking. Yeah. We have nothing to fear from them while they spend more strength fighting one another than in warfare with my forces. So while our attention is directed to each other, he's just sitting there like, I ain't got to do nothing. That, they're destroying themselves. But we're supposed to be a family. That was the point I wanted to make on Sunday. But moving into Monday, God is the owner of everything. Quite frankly, what this text is saying, everything belongs to God. Mm -hmm. And we are simply stewards, Elder, simply stewards entrusted with his belongings. He gives us our life, our breath, our health, our possessions, this structure that we say is ours, the cars that we say are ours, is because of God's grace that we have anything. Without God, we wouldn't exist. So, so then the last thing brought out, which I thought was really, really interesting, it says, because God made everything in the beginning, he is truthfully the rightful owner of all that exists including whatever we possess, no matter how hard and diligently and honestly we have worked for it. So we boast, I've done this, I've done this, that's mine. And you know, we claim oh, to, to, this is mine and that's my daughter or my son and my, hmm. my, my. We have to be careful that we don't overstep our bounds. God has lent it to us. That is God's son. That is God's, yes, you know, biologically, they came from us, but they actually belong to God. So we have to be careful in how we act with the things that we've been entrusted with. Mm -hmm. And what came to mind also in this lesson, when I was going through it, remember Nebuchadnezzar, what did he say? This great Babylon. It's this <laughs> great ba Babylon that I have built. Huh? But also David, David has the mindset to say everything belongs to God. As he says in Psalms 24 verse 1, the earth is the Lord and all it contains, the world and, and those that dwell in it. So you see the difference in comparison. One is saying, I, 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 me, me, me. And who does, who does that sound like? Mm. Satan. I want to send him. I want to be like the most high. I, I, I. So when we look at our own circle of influence and circle of, of, of um, 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 uh, uh, influence, we have to be careful that we don't start boasting. Look what I have done. Because then we take the, 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 the spirit or the character of the one that you mentioned ah. out of Mark. Your father is Satan. He was a murderer from the beginning, a liar, a deceiver, right? It is, it is these two parallels. One is, is lifting up Christ and God. The other is lifting up self and Satan. Ah. So, so the, the Bible says everything belongs to God. Everything, everything, everything that we have been entrusted to, we are simply stewards. That's why tithing is so important. Because it actually shows your loyalty and, and, and if you're able to, to, to realize that God has lent that to you. And it took me a long time to understand that. It took me a long time because, you know, of the mindset, okay, well, yeah, I work, I did this, it belongs to me, but we have to be careful. And I know we're going to get into tithing as the, as the quarter goes on, but I just want to highlight that, that 
we have to be careful how we treat the things that we have been entrusted to because God, God doesn't need our money. He don't need anything. It is actually a, 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 a trial and a test for us to see what we're going to do and who we're going to pay homage to. Yes, sir. Out of, so, really quickly, sure. really quickly on that point. In terms of everything that we hoard and we build and we make, every time we extract oil from the ground, God put it there. Mm -hmm. Every time we get gold, God put it there. Every time, whatever it is we make use of, the, the money that's paper that is made of from the trees and the things that they, we get on this earth, God made it. Mm -hmm. That's how everything we have is his. Mm -hmm. You do nothing of your own. God made it. Imagine us digging up gold, then hoarding it and placing it in vaults. Basing an econ economy off of silver and gold that God placed in the ground, right? And then we go and tell God he can't have access to what belongs to him anyway. Mm -hmm. Imagine telling your children, here, I give you access to my account. Use it as, as, as you need to. And then turn around, you go to get money out of that account, and your child tells you, uh-uh, uh-uh, you can't take no money out of that account. I need to use that. That's, I need to buy something with that. Can you imagine how you would feel? I'm going to yes. stop there. Let's go right to the mic because we got short, short time. Out of go right ahead. Very short. Yes, sir. If we have trouble giving up our own self, mm. then we will have trouble giving up our own needs. And mm. that's what we need to do. We need to first give ourselves. And if we can give ourselves, then we can give up our means. Amen. Amen. Out of you go ahead right quickly. Right after that. Right ahead. Stay at the mic. Stay at the mic. Go ahead. And then we'll move on to Tuesday's lesson. Just wanted to, good morning, everyone. Yes, morning. Yes, sir. Online oh, yes. Just wanted to bring everyone back to this point that Elder Old Boy made about withholding from God or giving to God and the two mindsets and the parallels. I want to take a slightly different tactic. We brought it up, just for those who don't know, we brought it up in in person service school this morning. Mm -hmm. And all who are viewing, are welcome to join us from time to time in the sanctuary. Amen. My mind goes to Proverbs chapter 15 and verses 1, 2, and 3. And I want to read three first out if I can, just quickly. I'm talking about withholding from God and, and, and not doing that as you, as you made the point about God and his children. He says, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good, the withholding and the giving. But verses 1 and 2 speak to a different aspect of our yielding to God. It says, a soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge right, but the mouth of fools pours out foolishness. What does this have to do with what Elder Old Boy mentioned? Oh, I'm with you. It's our mindset. Right. It's our influence. It's the way we handle one another. Yeah. Are we responsible stewards? with our attitudes, yes. with the way we look at situations, act and react to situations that occur. It's also this very important point that it's our influence that has the most telling, mm -hmm. most telling uh, position on whether others will accept or others will reject mm -hmm. what it is we're preaching. Mm -hmm. It's not so much the doctrine, it was the influence, it's the package that it's wrapped in. How do people perceive us? Do we, do we, are we, are we egregious? Are we, are we, do we want to get hostile and get into arguments when we disagree? Mm. Or, or do we apply the wisdom that the wise man is encouraging us? Amen. Amen. I just want to say really quickly, in terms of self, see, we can't um, dismiss this idea of what self does. Mm. Now, in heaven, when, when, when Lucifer had this self-actualization, self-realization, he, he immediately want itself to be above all else, right? Mm. Here's what, what the point uh, out of Hilda was, was, was getting to as well, I believe, in that the minute we focus on self, going back to the point that was made from the panel, we become children of our father, the devil. That's right. As soon as self becomes more than others, our desire, our needs, our wants, our own inflated view of our own righteousness and our own uh, 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 importance 
When that happens, we are living out the exact same issue that happened to Lucifer in heaven. Mm. And so we have to understand that if we're going to be part of the family of God, we have to operate in complete opposite to that. Mm. That it's always about others. Right? About God and about others. That's the commandments, yes? So God is saying, in order for this to work, you, you have to allow my spirit in you to not just uh, rearrange you, but to completely and utterly change you. Mm -hmm. Because at every point, you know why we argue? Because we're thinking, you're talking like that to me? Mm -hmm. This self-realization. Me, you know who I am in my own mind? I am the greatest thing that ever lived. How dare you disrespect me? Mm -hmm. And God is saying, it's not about you. Before so if it's not about you, then your behavior will be like the mind of Christ. That's right. You know what I'm saying? So it's deep. This, I'm telling you, this thing about self is very deep, and we have to move yes. on really quickly. Before, out before of we move, with. I want to give a real-life illustration to, to this point. My son, Jacoby, right, he has a bike. Technically, the bike is licensed in my name, Steve. It's registered, it's insured in my name, but it's his bike. I have given it to him as is. Now, if he got the wind up his backside, as they said, and tr tried to act as if he earned it and, you know, it, it really belongs to him, I could pull it if I wanted to. Mm. I don't, I'm not in need of the bike. I have a car. Right. You know, we drive, we drive in a car, but the bike is mine. It is on loan to him because he is the steward of the property that has been given to him. The same thing applies to us. Mm -hmm. Everything that is encompassed in this world belongs to God. We are the stewards of the things that have been entrusted to us for the betterment, not just of ourselves, but yeah. for those that we come in contact with. Absolutely, and that's what ties is about, others. It's always about others. Your gifts he gives you, others. It's always about others. The gift is never to glorify oneself because the minute we do, we become Satan mm -hmm. or like Satan, yes? We become like Satan. We have to be very careful about how we allow self to move ahead of God. Now, we got to move on to Tuesday. Brother Dilvian, Tuesday's lesson, resources available for God's family. Now, this, oh, I wish mm. we had more time because it's <laughs> deep about the resources that we have available to us. And again, it goes past the, 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 the material things. This is way beyond yes. material things. God earns us. Us. How can we tell him how we should behave when he earns us? So, Brother Dovian, take us into Psalm 37, verse 25. Quickly, we only have a few minutes so we can get through Tuesday's lesson. David says, I have been young, and now I'm old. Yet, have I never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread? Let me start here by speaking a bit on the behalf of God. A lot of times the, the picture is painted of God, the Father, as being this wicked, exacting God who can't wait to zap us the moment we sin. And it is only because of the Son, Jesus, begging and pleading, saying, Father, please spare Elder Smith. My blood was shed for him. We make it seem like that's the only reason why God doesn't zap him. Well, that may sound good and it may sell many books and it, it may make movies popular. It is a misrepresentation of the character of God. Because it is he, God, who says, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Hence why we see in John 3.16, where it says, For God so love the world. Allow me to demonstrate to you how the word so modifies the love. Now, Elder Allboy, if I turned to you and said, your head is shine, it's okay. <laughs> but if I said, Elder, your head is so shine, the word so modifies it, adds character, it deepens the impression, letting us know how really shine your head is. So when God says, when, when John says, for God so loved the world, it means that God didn't just love us just so, but 
he really, 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 a lot loved us. Mm. <clears throat> and here we see that when man sinned, God having loved us so much, could not afford to have us be separated from him. But he had to do something. He had to come and buy us back. Now, when you look on Haggai, Haggai says that God says the silver is mine, the gold is mine, yeah. everything is mine. But yet still, God didn't come to redeem us with anything corruptible. Instead, God emptied the bank account of heaven to come and buy us back. So this is again is showing you how much he so, mm, so, yes. so loved us. Mm. So much so that he loved us, that he gave his only begotten son to secure our ransom, to pay for our salvation and redemption. Now, Elder, because of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, we, according to John 1 verse 12, it says, as many of us who receive Christ, what does it say? We, we become cousins. <laughs> Did it say that? <laughs> we become nephews <laughs> or nieces. Let's say stepchildren then. No, we become children of God. So as many of us who accept what Christ has done in our behalf, we become children of God. By what Christ has done, God can now adopt us back into his family and treat us, elder, like how family should treat family. Mm -hmm. Hence, he sent his son to die for us, to buy us back. Why? Because he so loved us. Now, God knew that we need many things aside from salvation. But he says to us, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and everything will be added to you. Now, when you have done that, according to David in Psalms 23, verse 1, you shall have no need. Why? Because the Lord is your shepherd. Sure, you have some, some wants. The wants will always be there. But everything which is necessary for your salvation, for his glory, will be provided to you. And Philippians, Paul in Philippians says again, and my God shall supply some of your needs. Most of your needs. My God shall supply all of your needs. So everything that we need, God will and has supplied it. Now, while God has given us many gifts, such as the resources like our, the, the air in our nostrils, material blessings, spiritual gifts. Dare me to say, Elder, that the best gift and, or the second most important gift that God has given us is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Because when he, the Holy Spirit, is come, he will guide us into all truth. He will convict the world of sin and point us to the solution for our sin problem. The solution for the sin problem is the best gift that God has ever given us. Without the Holy Spirit, the best gift that God has ever given us would go to waste because we would never, ever know that it is there to save us. Now, the resources, I like that. So just listening to you to, to bring that out. This issue of the resources available for God's family. In other words, if we're God's family, then we have access to resources that in essence are limitless. Because if God created everything and we are his children, then when we ask for something, we're asking a God who is limitless in resources. He is the ultimate, and I'll say, the ultimate resource. He's the source of the resource, right? He's the ultimate source. So hence, he asks us to have faith because when we ask of him, we're asking somebody who is limitless in what he can do and what he has. 
right? So this issue becomes very important in terms of our, our becoming children. Because listening to you, uh, uh, Brother Dilvian, what happens then, God is saying, you have a different DNA altogether, a different blood altogether. So you can't be my children, right? It's like my son claiming to be yours, Elder. <laughs> no, brother, you, <laughs> there's no bloodline there. There's no DNA that could tie us together. But here's why being washed in the blood of Jesus is so important. Here's why letting the Holy Spirit work inside of us is so, is so important. Because through the Spirit, we have our DNA changed to look like DNA from Jesus Christ himself. His blood runs through our veins when the Holy Spirit is accepted in us. He begins to redo, recreate us from the inside so that our very DNA is like we were from God himself. Amen? Amen? So this is why it's important to be washed in the blood. Let the blood of Jesus run through your veins. Let him change you. Let him make you become more like him. Elder, go right ahead at the mic. I just say that the Holy Spirit works in us to the effect that when we study the word, we internalize it mentally and spiritually. When we are not doing that, those promises that God has made to us cannot come to fruition. They cannot come to fruition because we have not internalized it. Internalized it. We have learned recitations. Right? But it is not being made perfect in us. As a result of that, we don't have the faith to trust in God that what he says he will do, right? Even though he's the good shepherd and we shall not want, we are not believing that we mm -hmm. shall not want, believing that we have got to do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. right? So we must believe what we have read, that God says that he's going to do this and he will do it. Mm -hmm. It is going to happen. Amen. And see, this is talking about faith. He's given to every man a measure of faith. Faith is a resource we get from the source of all our resources. Everything we get is from God. Now, old oh boy, we're going to come right to you for Wednesday's lesson anyhow. So I'm going to hold you there for one quick second. <laughs> Responsibilities. I wish we could stay on this resource mm, business, boy. I tell you. Mm. Responsibilities of God's Responsibilities of God's family members. John chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3. Oh boy, take us there quickly. Sure, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. You know, I just wanted to uh, 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 speak on that word resource. So during the course of this study, um, I had looked it up and it was, it was so applicable to, to, to what was brought out. And it had quite a few definitions, but the one that spoke to me the most was a stock or supply of money, materials, staff, or other assets that can be drawn on by a person or organization in order to function effectively. Mm. John mm. 3.16 says, mm. says it best. Says it the best. You know, he gave his resource so we can function effectively, which uh -huh. is to have eternal life. So I, I wish we could stay, but we can't. Yeah. That's move. why you're better at things than me, and I'm better at things than you. Exactly. There's resources. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. See, I, see, I'm trying to make you stay on the resources. Out of, we're moving, I've we're got moving, to move we're to responsibilities. Yes, so um, responsibilities of God's family members. Well, a text that uh, was brought out was Matthew 22, verse 37. And he said, and he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This was Jesus quoting uh, from Deuteronomy chapter 6. And, <clears throat> excuse me, the interesting thing is we obey the commandments because we love God. Not simply out of legalism and, and all of that stuff, right? It's because of love that we obey, we obey. It says, if you love me, keep my commandments. It doesn't say, keep my commandments, and then you will love me. He puts your love first, and then it's the, the action, right? So that word keep is a, is, a, is a Greek word that says, tereo, which means to keep in view, to take note, to watch over. So God is saying, if you love me, watch over my commandments. If you love me, 
take note of my commandments. What do husband and wife say at the altar? They exchange vows, right? It's, a, it's an act of love. You say it and then you, you do it. So it's, it's, this is what we're seeing with Christ. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. But then John 3.16 says it the best. We've already, already uh, dived in it. So it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his, his only begotten son. He loved and then he gave. So he's saying to us, if you love, keep my commandments. Give me of yourself. Mm. This is your responsibility. But I liked how the uh, SCA Bible commentary summarizes it. Obedience without love is as impossible as it is worthless. Mercy. Yes, sir. But where love is present, a person will automatically set out to order his life in harmony with the will of God as expressed in his commandments. So you would do something, not for the sake that it's written there, but just simply because you love him. Mm. What did the parable of the two sons, remember he says, you know, go work in my vineyard. One said, okay, daddy, I'll go. Mm. And he didn't go. The other one said, no, I ain't going. But then he went. Yes, sir. It was the love of the second that made him go and work. Not lip service. Amen. It's Amen. not lip service. So, and, and I, I, and, and I want to uh, draw this point from Staff to Christ. It says, obedience is not a mere outward compliance, but the service of love. So we mm. say something, but then we act, right? The law of God is an expression of his very nature. It is the embodiment of the great principle of love. And hence, it is the foundation of his government in heaven and earth. If our hearts are renewed in the likeness of God, in the divine love it is implanted in the soul, will not the law of God be carried out in life? So if you, if, 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 going back to the mindset, Alda, if you have the mindset of Christ, your natural inclination is going to be able to act it out. Last point, Tina Turner had a song that says, What's love got to do with it? Everything. <laughs> everything. 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 Love has everything to do with it. It's because of the love that you'll keep the commandments. It's the love that we'll show compassion to one another. Mm -hmm. It's the love that we will come and, and lend service to, to, to helping um, God's ministry to go forward. It's the love. Yes, sir. That is the whole premise of the gospel. Is wrapped up in John 3.16. It's the love that compa compels us to mm. act. So is that our responsibility, Alda? Is that, that is our I, responsibility I'm going to, to, to I just love. Want, <laughs> 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 I'm going to go to out of Mark. Go ahead and make your comment really quickly. I love how out of over I put that. Yes. Um, he mentioned love God with all your heart and for your soul and for your mind. That's the first and great commandment. But if we were to um, put this in more details, and the second commandment is like unto this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. This is the second responsibility mm. of the commandment. Mm. If, if a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he's a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he have seen, how can he love God, whom he have not seen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, Jesus says um, he measures this love. When, when someone was hungry, when someone was thirsty, when someone was a stranger, when someone was naked, when someone was sick and in hospital, where was the love? Mm, I like that. I like that. Well, I'm just, before we move on to Thursday's lesson, I just want to point out something that the dictionary says about this word responsibilities. Yeah, because it, it lends some, some understanding as to what our responsibility of being a part of God's family is. It says a moral, that's the fact that it starts off with the word moral, a moral obligation to behave correctly towards or in respect of mercy. <laughs> and that's not, that's not a Bible commentary or, 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 or anything to do with the Bible. That definition is taken from the dictionary. <laughs> so it's amazing that this, this idea of our responsibility means that we are under the obligation 
to behave correctly towards others. How do I mean tell you? You come right to your point. How do towards others or respect of? So if 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 we're not thinking about the others, at least do it in respect of God, who has called us. Self is our greatest enemy, our greatest stumbling block to family being family. Self. Mm. Now we have to move on. Thursday's lesson, out of, out of Mark. Take us quickly into treasure in heaven. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21. Treasure in heaven. Treasure in heaven. Many of us know people that have wealth, that have houses, they have cars, they have it all. And many of us have heard of someone that had all this stuff and they died. Mm. And then you have the people, we have relatives all from, from out of the woodwork coming out, fighting <laughs> over the property. Yep. The first principle in this lesson is found in the title itself. It says, treasure in heaven. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21 says, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Mm -hmm. You cannot take this stuff with you when you die. Mm. Who has amassed great wealth only somehow to lose it? The lesson brings out that our world is an unstable, it's a very unstable place. Wars, mm. there's crime, there's violence, there's natural disasters, anything and everything can be taken away at a moment's notice. Death comes, and so these things become useless to us anyway. Mm -hmm. The second principle I want to share with you in this lesson in regards to treasure in heaven is that Scripture never, never tells us it's wrong to be rich or to have amassed wealth. Instead, in these verses, Jesus warns us to keep all in perspective. Mm -hmm. That's it right there. Amen. Rodney Smith, he, um, he, he mentioned in the quote, he said, um, God has given us in consuls to, I believe it was consuls to stewardship, God has given us the desire to be rich. There's nothing wrong with being rich in itself, but is your focus Jesus, the rich young ruler? He was rich in his wealth, but he was not rich in Jesus. Um, Abraham, he had rich possessions. Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3 says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. And not only is God talking to Abraham, he's talking to you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse him who curses you. And you and in you, all the families of earth shall be blessed. God was, wanted to use Abraham, his family, and his wealth to bless all the nations of God. God called Abraham a friend of God. He wants to call you a friend of God. Mm -hmm. So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. We have the same challenges that Abraham faced to lay up your treasure in heaven. What does it mean? To lay up your treasure in heaven means making God and his cause first and foremost in your life instead of making money first and foremost in your life. The sign above me says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. This is found in Matthew 6, verse 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. Using what we have for the work of God, for the advancement of his kingdom, for working in behalf of others, and for being a blessing to others. Mm -hmm. Finally, money 
is not the root of all evil. Hello. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. Love is the subject of money qualifies what the love is what love you're talking about. Mm -hmm. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which some coveted after. They have erred from the faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 19. Pastor Steed, he mentions, he he showed me this text. A feast is made for laughter, and wine maketh merry, but money answereth all things. Money is required to pay for for my children's BI tuition. Yes, sir. Money is required for your rent. Money is required for your mortgage. Money is required for you even returning a faithful tithe and offering. Mm-hmm. Money is required. And I'll conclude with this quote from Ellen G. White in Christ's Object Lessons. Money has great value because, because it can do great good in the hands of God's children. It is food for the hungry, drink for the thirsty, and clothing for the naked. It is a defense for the oppressed and a means of help to the sick. But money is of no more value than sand, Mm -hmm. only as it is put to use in providing for the necessities of life in blessing others and advancing the cause of Christ. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also Amen. Amen. I like that because we have to look at what does it mean to lay up treasures in heaven. Let me ask you a question. What is the currency of value on earth? What allows us to get things on earth? As we just so beautifully heard from Elder Mark, it's money. But ask the question, what is the currency that has value in heaven? What is it? Because it's certainly not you taking your money up there. It's not you taking your car, your bike, your house, your boat, and all this stuff up there. The currency that has value in heaven is your character. That's right. mm. So when he tells us, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, he's saying, lay up for yourselves your works and the, the, the submission to Christ that you do here on earth. It's what it says about those who die in Christ. Their mm. works do Follow them. That's right. That person has laid up treasures in heaven. All right? Mm -hmm. Amen. So I'm going to stop there because we have a sister on the mic, and I do not (laughs) want to pass you by. So go quickly, very quickly. We have a few minutes. Um, Jesus said he's gone to prepare a place for us. Mm -hmm. That means we have everything in heaven. We have everything. Yes. We have everything there. So we don't don't, don't need to... um, we, we, we don't need to, to, to be worrying, worrying, because we got everything in heaven. Amen. And when we die, we sleep. So we know we shouldn't worry about that either. Amen. Because when we die, we only sleep, waiting. We are just waiting for our Jesus to come and take us to yeah. heaven. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for that. You know, we have Alda. everything we need already. Yeah. Let's make sure we get it in heaven. But I want to just highlight before Alda Dilvin, Bob Dilvin, that you close out on Friday. It says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This word heart is cardia. Cardia. And here's what it means. The soul or mind as it is the fountain and seat of thoughts, passions, desires, appetites, affections, purposes, and endeavors. So what is he saying? Wherever you attach your heart to, your purpose, your appetite, your desire, everything that you are and want to be is focused on that thing. Therefore, you have no time for God. You have no ability to hear his voice. You don't even want God. And if I had time, I could tell you, I struggled with this thing a long time personally. I could tell you what it's like for God to make you understand. You love that thing more than me. Some of us love ourselves more than God. We got to get rid of it, but we got to close. Oh, we got a few minutes. Ooh, 
Ooh, thank you. Thank you. I've just been informed we got a couple more minutes. Amen. Amen. Yeah, Amen. Uh, before we go ahead. Here. Friday, um, talking about this, this, this thing of um, uh, treasures, right? Um, and out of Matthew spoke to it previously, but in Matthew six twenty five, it says, "Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life." what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Mm -hmm. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet, they are, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? So whilst we uh, uh, contemplate life and sometimes we struggle. How am I going to pay this bill? How am I going to get do this? How am I going to, you know, we, mm. we get anxious and, and, and anxiety because of, 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 of life. And sometimes it's due to our own um, um, actions <laughs> that we have all this anxiety and debt and stuff like that. But here God is, Jesus is saying, hey look, i am got you, bro. I know you need clothes. I know you need food. I know you need housing. Is not your life more than worth more than a bird? Mm. Mm. Huh? You know, like we have to stop and pause. These scriptures are there for us. They're there to teach us and to, to give us counsel. That we have to like really slow down and take what God is saying to word and not just for fluff. Like, yeah. you know, it, we have to really believe God said it, that settles it, I believe it. Yeah. My wife is about to uh, finish school in her bachelor's, right? And, She's, she's going for her masters, God willing, after that. That's go God's got to find the money for that, not me. <laughs> he said it. Yeah. He said, you have not. Because you asked him. Because you asked not. Yes. And I asked him, find the money. <laughs> I'm claiming he promised. Praise God. That, that's, that, that, that's, that's very real. Because, I ain't got it. Amen. This thing about laying up for ourselves treasures on earth. Laying. Well, you know something? We might skip past that, but most of us do, you know. That's right. Most mm -hmm. of us do. I'll tell you what. How many of us have a garage that a car can't fit in? <laughs> huh? Because it's got all manner of stuff that yep. we ain't seen in 10, 12 years laid up in that garage. <laughs> Some of us laid up in a, in a storage place that we rent somewhere else. Mm. And we ain't seen, we don't even remember what's in that storage, that storage being, but we be laying it all up. Um, um, how many of us lay stuff up like, like, like me, I'm sorry, up in our roof? We uh -huh. got a whole lot talk of stuff it, up it. in the roof <laughs> that we ain't seen in a long time. Just laying stuff up on earth, right? Living for, 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 for money. Wake up every day because, you know, that's my purpose. I got to get money. And yet when God says, let me give you some treasures that are valuable in heaven, like kindness, mm. meekness. Forgiveness, gentleness. love, love. Huh? Oh, gentleness, yes. brotherly love. Mm -hmm. well, let me give you some of them things. And we're like, huh? Well, listen, let me go, let me go search through my store and see if I can find something else to satisfy my need right now. Mm. God is saying, no. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Don't keep hoarding all the things that you don't even use anymore. Mm -hmm. Live simply. Trust me. And develop character. Brother Dillian, go right ahead. We're going to... We're going to end with you. We have one minute to, to 11.05, and I've been instructed we end at 11.05. So you can do your thing and end Friday's for us at 11.05. 11, Amen. There was one quick point I wanted to make on Thursday. There's a line that says, among other things, it means using what we have for the work of God, for the advancement of, of his kingdom, for working in the behalf of others, and for a blessing to others. So a lot of us, we, we have money in the bank, put down. But there are people who need stuff. Take some of that money out. Give to a, a mission cause. Spend it on, on, on someone else because it's just their growing interest and you, you probably will never use it. You may mm -hmm. die, leave it. So this is one way how to store up treasures in heaven. Those clothes that you have, people are, are on the street now cold. Take them and give them away. Store up mm -hmm. treasures in heaven. Make it practical. Now, on to Friday. It says, in the beginning, God created everything. 
by virtue of him creating everything, it means he owns everything, mm -hmm. even us. Hence, why when we sinned, God emptied heaven's bank account yes, to sir. pay our ransom. For God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son. Christ came and died in our stead that he may reconcile us back to God who so loved us. Christ, having gone back to heaven, has now left us with the comforter. God broke the bank of heaven to save us. All the hosts of heaven are actively involved in the work of our redemption. The question which is left then is, after God has done all of this, what does he require of us? Moses answers greatly in Deuteronomy. And now Israel, what does the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to love him, and serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I have commanded you this day for thy good. Simply put, God wants our love and our obedience after he has done all of this for us. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Oh boy, please close us out in prayer. Sure, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to be a part of your family. And we have an awesome responsibility as bestowed upon us by you that we should go and make disciples of others and invite them into your family. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and his redemption and dying on the cross for us. Now, Lord, help us to tarry for the Mass until you come. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Happy Sabbath. God bless you all. Stay with us for our service as we move into our worship service today. Amen. God bless. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. It's a new year. Happy New Year and welcome to 2023 at Hamilton Seventh Day Adventist Church. Here are the events in our family news. The Community Services Department would like to thank those who contributed to the grocery voucher given and to those who worked tirelessly to prepare, serve, and clean up after the meals. May God continue to bless you in your service for the Master. Heartiest congratulations are extended to Arian Murray who was called to the bar yesterday, January 6th. To God be the glory, great things he has done. And continuing our church family news, I'd like you to remember that there is power in prayer. God sees and he hears and he will answer your prayers. So I invite you to pray for our grieving family members and those who are sick and indisposed. Our thoughts and prayers are going out to Sister Edith Francis, who lost her husband. Our sincere condolences to you, and may God comfort you in this difficult time. So, let's take a look at what's happening this week. Just a reminder from the Happy Seniors Club, they resume activities on Tuesday, January 24th. And if you have old games, such as dots and dashes, please bring them with you. See you then! Our regular feeding program is on Wednesday at 4 to 5 p.m. Come on out, get a meal, serve, 
share, bless someone. Also on Wednesday at 6.30 is our prayer meeting. Come on out for your midweek power recharge. It's celebration time. On Sunday, January 8th, Christine Keynes will celebrate her birthday. Happy birthday. January 9th, Monday, Jermaine Darrell and Nyambi Landy will have their birthday. Have a wonderful time celebrating. Tuesday is a good day to have a birthday. On January 10th, we have Anthony Davis, Helen Burrows, and Dion Francis celebrating. Happy birthday. Wednesday, January 11th is your day to make a wish, John Luca Gibbons and Samara Lee Birch. It's your birthday. Let the celebrations begin. Happy birthday. Tamara Stevens will have her birthday on Thursday, January 12th. Happy birthday. And to end this week of birthday celebrations, on Friday, we have three celebrants, Cadian Bean, Shanae Williams, and Elder Evan Douglas. Happy birthday. To end these announcements, let me leave a reminder with you. This is taken from Luke 6 and verse 31. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Happy New Year and God bless you. These were your announcements for today. Have a happy Sabbath.
Good morning and happy Sabbath, Hamilton. Good morning, happy Sabbath, Hamilton. You guys are here, right? Happy New Year. This indeed is the Lord's Day, and we are glad that you have decided to join us in person and those that are online. May we please stand for the call to worship. The Bible tells us in the book of Psalms, chapter 84, verse, beginning with verse 10, it says, Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk, whose walk is blameless. In verse 12, Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Hamilton Church, 2023, the first Sabbath. Good morning, happy Sabbath. You have been called to worship. Amen. Happy Sabbath, Church. Come before his presence with thanksgiving. some reason you have permitted us to make it into this place to see another new year in God's house. God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for keeping us through 2022. Even at the times when we doubted you, you still stuck by us. You have still provided for us. You have still sustained us. You have still carried us. And we've come into this place today because we just want to say thank you. We want to say thank you for, for loving us, for never giving up on us, for cherishing us. Even when we didn't even like ourselves, you loved us. So God, in this service, in this new year, as we look forward to what you're going to do next, may we always keep on our lips a word of praise, a word of thanksgiving, 
Because if you never do anything else for us, you have already done enough. Thank you, Father, for loving us today. In Jesus' name, let everyone say amen. Amen. Sing for the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting. on. It's 2023, and here we are together in the presence of God to pray and to ask God to lead us into, the, into this future year, 2023. As the praise team leads us in our hearts and our minds to prepare for prayer, I ask you, remember others as you pray. 
Father in heaven, here we are, marching God into 2023 with hope, with faith, and trust in you and you alone. None of us understand what this year holds, oh God, but our prayer, Father, is that by the power of your Holy Spirit that each and every one of us will never again repeat the mistakes of 2022. Lift us and move us forward, God, in every aspect of our lives. For some, Heavenly Father, is health challenges, and we know many of our brothers and sisters uh, are in the hospital right now. We think of Brother Tatum and many others, God, Brother Eversley and so many others. Father, so many, are, they may not be in the hospital, but but they're struggling, they're suffering. We think of Brother Gerald also as he's away right now. Jesus, my prayer is that you will lift us and move us forward into 2023, even help us to overcome our health challenges. But Father, many of us also need spiritual uplifting. 2022, for some of us, was a discouragement. But Father, we pray that this year will be different that we will gird up our loins, stand firm in our hope in Jesus Christ, and Lord, allow the joy of Jesus to permeate our lives in every aspect, whether it be through our families, whether it be at our jobs or our friends, church, everything that we do, touch it, God, that this year many souls will be one to Jesus and that we ourselves will make our calling and election sure. So this church, I pray that you will bless Holy Spirit, bless and enter in. Enter in. Enter in. And Father, today is the beginning of a brand new life for every one of us. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for your blessing. Thank you for who you are. And thank you for choosing us. We will do what you ask. Guide us in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, Amen.
choir is going to do our special selection. It does say Janae Smith. Um, so we, we're going to fill in. We're doing a, I shall wear a crown. Amen. It's funny, as you think of your, your New Year's resolutions and my uh, colleagues at my job, they ask me, so what you doing? And I said, I'm just doing every moment by moment. I can't think about the year, but day by day. And I pray that I shall wear a crown. It's all in my life.
Sabbath. Welcome to the blessing that we have embarked into in this 2023 year. Family, we are two of the faces you will be seeing from week to week with other enthusiastic team members joining us very soon. We will be greeting you and welcoming you into the house of God. We are the front line to whomever the Holy Spirit prompts and guides into our church from week to week. We are the first impression team of the Hamilton Seventh-day Adventist Church and wherever else we are called to serve. We are not here for form and fashion. We are here because we have taken up the call for mission to welcome God's people into his house of worship. You have been praying for that loved one to return to God, for them to come to know him and to learn of his love for them. Well, with your continued prayers and with the Holy Spirit speaking to them and wooing them, you and all of heaven will rejoice to see the miracle that God's miracles are real. When that someone walks up those stairs, we will all rejoice because we have been praying for them to come as the Holy Spirit woos them. I'm going to ask that our visitors, our guests, family that is not of the Hamilton Seventh-day Adventist Church, please stand. Now I greeted you. I greeted you. I'm sure that please stand. Well, we welcome you nonetheless. And may you find this to be a friendly place. Oh, thank you. Yes, please. You're okay? <laughs> Nonetheless, we welcome you. And it's a pleasure for us to have you here welcoming, worshiping with us today because our congregation is indeed blessed by your presence. I am Sister Angela Bean, and with me is Sister Nicole Matthews. We are servants of the Most High God. And it's our honor to serve you, the members and guests here at the Hamilton Seventh-day Adventist Church, where worship is a joy and the love is real. Welcome, everyone. Pastor Steve. Again, the Church of the Living God, say amen. Come on, can somebody say amen today? How many are you glad to be here in God's house today? How many of you are blessed to be uh, in his presence? You guys turn that mic up for me a little bit. It is good to be here in God's house today. What a blessed time, and it is a new year. If you could just turn to your neighbor and just wish them a happy new year right now. Just give say happy new year to your neighbor. Happy new year. Huh? Now, now some, some, some of you did that the way you did it last year right? You didn't have a smile on your face. You were grumpy. You brought, you brought 2022's grumpiness over to 2023. Huh? So I want you to turn to your neighbor with a smile this time, huh? with a big smile, and just say, Happy New Year. Huh? Uh, Happy New Year. We are glad to be here uh, in God's house today. Welcome to the Hamilton Seventh-day Adventist Church, where worship is a joy and the love is real. Our theme this year is God's going to set you free in 2023. God's going to set you free in 2023. So to those of you that are listening, 105 FM, our Facebook viewers, our YouTube viewers, our ATV viewers, our live stream viewers, we welcome you to our services today. May the Spirit of God fill your cup till it runneth over and you are free. And remember, when the sun has set you free, you are free indeed. I just have a few quick announcements that I need to share with you. Number one is next weekend. Next weekend is officer training. If you are an officer in the Hamilton SDA Church, there will be training provided for you. Begins 5 p.m. on Sabbath evening, 5 p.m. And then again on uh, Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. It's important to note that immediately following the 5 o'clock uh, officer's training on Sabbath evening, 
Uh, there will be, uh, if you would, a concert uh, from our very own Sister Simone uh, and friends. I think that's another Sister Simone. If, come on, stand up, Simone. Let them see you. Let them see who you are. But Simone's going to be, uh, yeah, she's going to bless us. Very gifted musician uh, and singer. She will be having a concert here right after officer's training. Uh, there's a couple of special guests. Roger Hernandez and Jesse Wilson will be with us uh, next weekend uh, to help us with uh, that officer uh, training. Uh, as some of you noticed uh, when you came into church earlier today, uh, we are, uh, if you would, in a small trial period uh, as we try to accommodate the needs of our congregation coming out of this pandemic. And so you will notice uh, that things started differently uh, right after, if you would, uh, early morning manner. We went into uh, in-person Sabbath school, uh, which then led into preliminaries, which then led into our Lagos University starting right around 10 o'clock, uh, which then, if you would, uh, took us into a little space where we're wide today. We started at 11.15. We're not sure that's going to be permanent. We're just trying this out for now to see how it works. We'll continue to evaluate it, but we just want to make sure we are meeting uh, the needs of our entire congregation as we move into 2023. Is that all right, church? And so we are making those adjustments. We'll continue to uh, fine-tune it. Uh, and make whatever necessary changes are needed as we move along. Hey, listen, man, there is one Sabbath birthday today uh, in that of Sister uh, Virginia Simons. Can the church say amen? Amen, amen. Also, you should know, and we uh, regret uh, to announce, as we have said a couple of times before, but the passing of our dear brother, Brother Francis Morris. Uh, he got some calls. Uh, some people uh, were panicking thinking it was uh, Brother Morris Francis. Uh, for some reason, that's been always an issue of confusion. Uh, it was confusing for me when I first came. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, is that I know his brother Francis Morris, his wife, Sister Edith, was able to visit with them and spend some time with them. Um, she's, in, she, she, she's very, if you would, her spirits are high. Um, uh, she believes in her Redeemer. <laughs> and she's looking forward to that day. <laughs> But the amazing thing is, the reason I say our spirits are so high was uh, when Elder Douglas and I went into the home, it was very wet, it was very mucky, it was very muddy. And when we walked in, I wasn't paying attention. Douglas paid attention. I wasn't paying attention. I had muddy footprints all over her floor. And when I turned around and looked, oh, sis, I messed up your floor. Um, and I said, I said, don't worry, we're going to clean that up before we leave. And she said, no, you're not. I said, yes, I am. I'm, I'm, we're going to clean this up. She, she said, I, I said, sis, I can't have you clean up the mud I put on your floor. She said, why not? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And she was determined to get me out the house so she could clean her floor. Uh, she was happy. <laughs> she was more than happy to clean her floor. But I'm just thankful that God has kept her uh, throughout uh, this pandemic. I know when I visited her before, it was actually right in the heat of the pandemic. Um, and her spirits were high then. And so we look forward to that great day with great anticipation. There are many members you should know. There are many of our members, especially our seniors, that are ill right now. There's some in the hospital. There's some this. I would encourage you to check on that. For some reason during this time of year, uh, we tend to lose some. And I just, just pray with you that, in essence, our God would keep our seniors during uh, this three winters, these winter months. Um, it's just something about them. I don't know what it is about January, February, and March. We already have two funerals scheduled for uh, this month. Um, we hope it doesn't continue, uh, but in the past it has. And so I just encourage you not just to pray for our seniors, but to reach out to those perhaps you haven't seen in a while and touch base with them and let them know that you love them. We are blessed to be here in God's presence. I'm thankful that God has brought us through another year. Um, if you believe that the same God that kept you in 2022 will keep you in 2023, can you say amen today, church? Can you say praise the Lord? Come on, can you put, I know it's rainy outside, but can you put your hands together and just bless God today for his goodness, for his grace, and for his mercy. If you would at this time, if you would just stand with me uh, at this time, let us stand together. It's time to greet one another in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Come on, let's stand together. Repeat after me uh, this morning. There's no place, uh, come on, like this place, uh, 
anywhere near this place. So this must be the place. Uh, uh, come on, man. Turn to your neighbor. Say, neighbor, it's a new day and a new year and a new attitude. <laughs> come on, man. Just tell your neighbor, happy Sabbath, shake their hand, tell them that you love them, tell them it's good to be in God's house as we worship the Lord and we say welcome to Hamilton SDA. the weather has been the last few days? Well, a wise person once said, beautiful things never cry for attention. Think about a beautiful sunset scattering beautiful hues we have no names for. Think about a rose blossoming with its deep reds, blushing up towards busy onlookers. Think about a hummingbird in its magnificent color and flight movements. All these beautiful things in life, yet, they are easily unnoticed as they do not cry for our attention. Jesus' life was a perfect example of how being present is fundamental to glorifying God and uplifting others. Even though he knew the cross was his end, he stayed present in every interaction along the way. Present when the mothers brought their children to him to be blessed. Present when the woman with the issue of blood shared 12 years of her struggle. Present when an everyday beggar born blind, just wanted to see. How do we follow Jesus' footsteps and stay grounded? I believe that this was the spirit of Jesus' remarks when he said, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own, Matthew 6, verse 34. In other words, be present on this day, in this moment. However, for many of us, this seems impossible. There are so many things to worry about. We have school, work, bills, children, pets, and many other day-to-day -day distractions. In addition, we can't help but pick up our phones every 10 minutes. These advancements in technology introduce the temptation of multitasking. 
It is true that doing things while folding laundry or cooking can help these menial tasks pass with greater joy. However, when this comes to relationships, this can be devastatingly distancing. If someone is speaking to you, fight to be present. Resist the urge to think about how you are going to respond before they are finished. This obsession with multitasking stems from our belief that if we are not overworking, then we are not working at all. We have been bewitched by the hustle. We do not know how to rest, and some of us feel guilty for resting at all. Science states that we should rest every 15 minutes for every hour of work that we do. But rest isn't simply a great recommendation of science, but a requirement of God. He gave us the Sabbath day because he believed in rest and resetting the mind, body, and spirit before sin ever entered the world. Genesis 2 verse 2 says, By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So, on the seventh day, he rested from all of his work. But did God rest as someone weary? No, but as one satisfied and pleased with his created work. Yet this example teaches us that God never made man to work without end and lose sight of eternity. And not only eternity, but all the beautiful things along the way to our eternal home. He gave us a day to- My name is Hal Masters. I originally came across green light when I was watching a uh, advertisement where they were promoting solar panels, which was uh, something I was always interested in. So anyway, I- Even if only for a moment. Allowing us to be grounded, present, in this eternal moment without one thought for tomorrow. Luke asks, can anyone add to their stature or the length of their life by worrying about it? Even in the time of trouble, the time designated for trouble, Jesus says to us in Matthew 10, when they deliver you up, do not worry or be apprehensive about how or what you will say, for it shall be given you in the self same hour. So why worry about the big stuff if you can't even make the little things happen? Do you have the power to turn a flower into a loquat that has a seed in it? Will cherries show up later this year because of your great power? Have you noticed how God never forgets where each tree is? This is light work to him. Some of you couldn't even find your phone, glasses, or even dentures this morning. Can you make a black cow eat green grass and produce white milk? Well, when you're able to handle God's light work, then maybe you can ask for increased responsibilities. Until then, he's got this year completely under control and simply asks you to stay in the present and marvel at his good works. He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Have a happy Sabbath. welcome our little ones up for the children's story and children's scripture reading and we're going to sing this little light of mine
Good morning, church. Today's scripture reading will be taken from Ephesians 2, verse 10. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, children. Happy New Year. Well, my story is entitled Trusting God. Alexia, thank you for reading. And I do have a, my story is based on this verse. And I brought two Bibles because there are different translations, right? So I'm reading from Deuteronomy 10 20. What did I say? And it says, You must fear the Lord your God and worship him and cling to him. Your oath must be in his name alone. How many of you have seen this Bible? Do you use it at, at school? Some of you? So this is the children's version, and it says, Respect the Lord, your God, and serve him. Be loyal to him. Now, what does fear mean? My first Bible says to fear. To be scared of, right? That's what it says. That's the normal. Yeah. To be afraid of something. But that translation also has a different meaning because it comes from a Hebrew word. I'm not going to go into that, but in the Bible, the word fear, just a minute, hold on to that thought. It means to reverence. It means we are to worship, that he is our mighty God, that he's our all in all, right? So when we see a king or somebody important, we, we respect them, right? We show respect like King Charles the third, yes? So he's a king. So we show respect to somebody important, but God is our king. Now, when our world so is so important, because when our world turns upside down and we are scared, how many of you are sometimes scared of something? We all are, right? Some people are scared of roaches or whatever, but they're scared of something, right? And it's so important. Then the other half of our verse, it says to cling to him, right? So I'm going to show you because this is so important. And disclaimer, everybody that's here, you might get wet. What is this? That's right. And a jar, right? This is an empty cup, right? Okay. I was practicing. I need everybody on that side to, I think, move. Children, come this way. <laughs> so, Lauren, come this way. <laughs> 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 
That's right. That's right. Pedro said, I think everybody should have a poncho. When we fear the Lord, but we know that he loves us and that he's going to take us through difficult times, we cling on to him. We don't know what's going to happen. Our lives can be shuffled, and I know that mine was shuffled this summer. I didn't know what was going to happen, but I trusted God. And I held on to him, and I didn't know what was going to happen, and I was very scared. <laughs> so I put water in here, and I'm going to go, oh, oh, so me. And I'm going to keep this water here, and I'm going to go all the way around and make sure that it does not wet anyone. Okay? Because we're trusting in God. Here I go. One, two, and... Did it rip? So I demonstrated that when we cling on to God, he will take us through difficult times. He will keep us. He will surround us. He will hold us. Some of you have different circumstances in your classroom. Maybe you're having problems with a teacher or a friend, and we don't know how it's going to be the outcome. But I can tell you, we don't know. But when we hold on to our God, and you know what? You learn these verses every day at school, and they do come and play. I remember when we went campery, and we had to do the zip line. And I was very scared. I cried. All the Pathfinders went through. Pedro was the first one. Whee! I was the last one because I did not believe. But guess what? I was saying to myself, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There are Bible verses that will take us through a path. And this summer for me was trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not to thy own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And guess what? I learned that at the eye. And we even made a song about it. And that was the song that brought me through this summer. So whenever you have a circumstance, remember to cling on to God and to fear him. Okay? Anybody like to pray? Bow your heads and close your eyes for prayer. Thank you, Father. Thank you for this day. Be with us as you go through this Sabbath. Help us to be safe. Help us to follow you. Thank you for, thank you for letting us go through last year, and help us to be safe this year in Jesus' name, amen. amen.
Amen, church? Amen. Wasn't that a beautiful story? Yeah. Amen. Today, as we consider tithe and offering, today is January 7th, the seventh day of the new year. God tells us in the book of Exodus chapter 12, he said to Moses, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Not referring to January, but referring to Nisan. The first month of the new year. And the Bible, as it continues in chapter 12 of Exodus, tells us that on the first day, it should be a holy congregation, a Sabbath. But it continues to say that on the seventh day of Nisan, it should also be a holy convocation. Today is the seventh day of our first year, or first month for our first year, or year. And as God revealed these principles to his people through Moses. He said to them, get yourselves a lamb, and thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, with your shoes on your feet, with your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste and it shall be the Lord's Passover. On the seventh day of the new year, Nisan, it was a holy convocation, a Sabbath. But God was preparing his people to take them into the Canaan land. You see, Egypt was about to be behind them. The things of 2022 was about to be behind them, and God was preparing them for 2023. God was preparing his people to walk in a new land. It was leading them towards the Canaan land. It would have rained manna from heaven for them as they journeyed towards the Canaan land. It would have caused the sea to part and allowed his people to walk on dry land as they head towards the Canaan land. As you progress in 2023, God is going to open some paths for you. He's going to cause you to walk on some dry land. He's going to lift you up to some high places. He's going to prepare a place, a table before you, in perhaps the presence of your enemies. In 2023, God is about to anoint you with oil and, get, and let your cup run over. In 20 and 23, the Bible says that surely goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. But he also asks that you may be faithful in your tithe and offering so that these blessings can be bestowed upon you. As the deaconet comes forward, what God has done in the past is able to do again in the future. This morning's appeal is not one of New Year's resolution, but it is one of recommitment. Recommitting your lives, recommitting your time, recommitting your resources to your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that you may be faithful and that he will hold up, hold you up as you proceed throughout 20 and 23. Your heads are bowed, your eyes closed. Righteous God, our Heavenly Father, we have seen, O oh Lord, what you've done for your people in the past. We now, O oh Lord, will remain faithful that you will do for us according to your will what you will do for us in 20 and 23. May you bless us, may you keep us throughout this year. 
and may this tithe and offering go according to your will, to the furtherance of your work. These mercies we ask in Jesus' name. Let God's people say, Amen. 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 Just want to praise you forever and ever, God. scripture reading this morning is taken from the book of Matthew chapter 24 reading from verses 22 to 35 Matthew 24 22 to 35 and except those days be shortened shortened there should be no flesh be saved but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, Believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. 
For, who, for wheresoever the carcass is, there the eagles be gathered together. <clears throat> Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds, in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. Likewise, ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. God bless you. Amen. The song says, all of my life, I've never known you to fail. Amen. Wonderful is your name, Lord.
Amen. Wonderful is his name. And because of that, we give him total praise. Church of the Living God, say amen. Uh, you just heard the wonderful voices of, I guess what I call them, the first Sabbath choir. Can the church say amen? It's the first Sabbath choir. Uh, if you want to join the first Sabbath choir, uh, 
Let me. You want to join the first Sabbath choir? Uh, and you can sing. Uh, just throw that to you. Somebody said, I can almost sing. Somebody said, I can almost sing. But if you would like to join that, see Brother Mike um, just praising God for the wonderful job uh, he's done in just his first few months. We give God praise uh, for Brother Mike Spencer. Um, and all our musicians, Janae and uh, Brother Terry, who uh, did not invite me to beat him in dominoes the other night. But it's all right. Come on, let's get into God's word, spirit of the living God. In the wee hours truly of this morning, you and I had a conversation about this moment. Speak now, Lord, for thy servant is listening. In Jesus' name, let the redeemed of the Lord say amen. Come on, somebody say amen. Oh, what a blessed time it is to be here in God's house. Today we kick off a brand uh, new series uh, from the book of Revelation. Revelation is the series uh, for uh, this uh, foreseeable future. I lift up before you verse, uh, if you would, verse 7. Uh, verse 7 uh, of the first chapter of the book of Revelation. And here's what the Bible says. Behold, uh, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I have entitled this unveiling, this riveting, this Christocentric pericope. Simply, he is coming. He is coming. It's very interesting to me because Revelation is oftentimes a book that many in Christianity run from. Uh, it's a book that is vastly misinterpreted. Uh, to be quite honest with you, even uh, when we are as Adventist ministers preparing to preach from Revelation, uh, we have a plethora of books that are low loaded in software. I mean, literally thousands upon thousands, literally 10, 15, 20,000 books are in this one software bundle that comes. And it's interesting because they let us know very clearly that it's okay to use those commentators for all the other books of the Bible. <laughs> Uh, but when it comes to Revelation, uh, you need a plan to just steer clear of them because they really don't have a clue. It's very interesting that you should know that in essence the Seventh-day Adventist Church has 28 fundamental beliefs. 28 fundamental beliefs, right? However, however, we only originated one. 28 beliefs. There's 28 beliefs. Some will call them doctrines. We tend to use beliefs because we never believe we have all the truth. Jesus is all the truth. He has all the truth, right? But it's, and, and, and truth is progressive. So we believe that we have 28 fundamental beliefs, but 27 of them were there before we showed up. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. This is why uh, you ought not to, uh, if you would, uh, kick our brothers from other faiths down too much uh, because the truth is, is that many of them had what you now hold precious before you even showed up. Uh, what am I talking about? I'm saying to you that the only one we contribute to the 28, as many of us know, is the sanctuary doctrine. That's it. Huh? In other words, better said, we're the ones that explain revelation. Uh, pause. We're the ones that explain God's way in the sanctuary and how he will deliver this world from this mess. But the truth is, is that the Trinity was around before us. Come on now. Uh, the Sabbath, ooh, the Sabbath was around, can you believe that, before us? Huh? Come on now, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, around, if you would, these beliefs in this, before us, the unity of the church, around, before us, the second coming of Jesus, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, all were beliefs that existed before us. It's a sanctuary that we contribute to this, and it's important because the sanctuary is littered all through the book of Revelation. 
I want to take you, if you would, to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1, because there's a lot to cover here today. We don't have much time. The Bible says the revelation of Jesus Christ, and I just need to pause right there. Say that with me. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Oh, I need you to understand uh, that this book is a revelation. Uh, it is an unveiling uh, of the veiled. Uh, in other words, it once was, it once was open. <laughs> Then it got shut, and now John is opening it again. Turn with me, if you would, to Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. Daniel, the 12th chapter and verse 4. For those of you that permitted your Bibles to come to church with you today, let's go to Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. We're going to read that together. Daniel, the 12th chapter and verse 4. Here's what the Bible says. But thou, O Daniel, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words, and seal the book, even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be, what everybody, shall be increased. Daniel is instructed to shut up the book until the time of the end. And now here we are, if you would, in the book of Revelation. It's the time of the end, and if you would, John is instructed to open the book. It's time to unveil what God is about to do. Our friends, I need you to understand, uh, if you would, uh, that in essence, there's a lot going on amongst the Christian church when John writes this book. It's an amazing moment because, if you would, uh, the church is being persecuted. The Christian church is being persecuted, not just by the Romans, but by the Jews. Uh, the truth is, is that they don't like them because the Christian church will not confine, or if you would, give into uh, the foolishness that's being taught and carried on. What are you talking about? There were two things. Uh, there were two things that they fought against. Number one, number one, the Christians refused to eat meat that was offered to idols. They would have these big old services to worship idols and they would bless them and ask the idols to bless the food and all this kind of stuff. And the Christians said, we're not doing that. For that reason, they were persecuted. They believed that they served one God. They ought not to be bowing down to a God that can't even hear what they have to say. A God that has ears but cannot hear. Uh, a God that has lips but cannot speak. A God, if you want, that has eyes uh, but cannot see. A God that has hands uh, but can't touch. In their minds, uh, they were only to bow down to the King of kings and Lord of lords. I need you to understand that in these last days, uh, God is calling for a people that will only bow down to him. <laughs> oh, you've got to understand. Not only that, but in essence, the second thing they refused to participate in uh, was the temple process. Prostitution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in other words, at the temples for these gods, there would be a bunch of prostitutes there. And the idea was, if you sleep with the prostitutes, you would actually fertilize the earth. The Christians said, that's a bunch of garbage. We're not doing that. And for that reason, they are persecuted profusely. They're under duress. They're persecuted day and night. They're still trying to separate their identity from the identity of the Jews who are always starting riots. The Jews were, listen, the, the, the thing about it was they were so mad at the Roman oppression that they would burn stuff down. They would start riots. They would do all kinds of craziness. And the Christians were identified with them and were persecuted with them. So now John comes onto the scene. I need you to understand that John is the writer of five books in the Bible. Uh, he's the writer of St. John. He's the writer, if you would, of the three epistles, first, second, and third John. But he's also the writer of this great apocalyptic book, this book we call Revelation. It's an amazing thing because it is the unveiling, it's the revealing. And I need you to understand this. The Bible lets us know very clearly it is the revelation of who, everybody? Of Jesus Christ. Take me to verse 1. It is the revelation of who? Of Jesus Christ. Now, pause with me just for a second. Because when you look at just those first few words, I know, I know I got some more verses to go. But if you look at just those first few words, what you're seeing uh, is the, not just the unveiling, but what you have here is, if you would, ambiguity in the Greek text as to whether or not we are talking about the objective genitive or the subjective genitive. Oh, you're going to get it in just a second. In other words, it says the revelation of Jesus Christ. Hmm. In other words, if you would, if you, if you just stay with me, understand this, that in this particular pericope, 
We are talking about Jesus as not just, the, if you were, the subjective, but also the objective. That in essence, he's not just the subject of the sentence, he's also the object of the sentence. He's actually both in this particular text. Hence, there is no distinction in the Greek because he's actually both. What am I talking about? That in essence, uh, this is a revelation about Jesus Christ. Hold on. But it's also a revelation by Jesus Christ. Uh, that Jesus Christ is the one that is revealing himself uh, to us. Our uh, friends, it's amazing because which God gave to him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. I need to help you just teach you just a little bit more because I need you to understand today that we do not believe uh, in word uh, inspiration. We believe in thought inspiration. Oh, Lord, help us. Uh, that in essence, if you would, uh, what you find throughout the pages of Scripture are not, if you would, this literal verbatim written by the hand of God. But rather God moved upon men. And he changed the lives of men. And then men wrote their experiences based upon their change and new outlook on life. Hence, when they wrote it, they wrote it in their own words. Oh, that's why Genesis if you would, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, they all sound the same. Why? Because they're all written by Moses. Uh, but when you get further in there, you know, Jeremiah doesn't sound the same. Uh, and Samuel doesn't sound the same. Uh, and David's writing a bunch of songs and love stories. Uh, and Solomon's writing his stories. And you find all these different, if you would, ways of writing scripture. Yet, throughout the entire book, the theme still remains the same. Uh, the Old Testament declares that Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. And the New Testament says he came. He died. He rose again. He ascended to heaven and he's coming back to take us home. I need you to understand there is no contradiction amongst the authors in scripture written over 1500 years if you would on three different continents written in three different languages yet somehow the same spirit prevails the same spirit rules the, the, if you want the pages of scripture, why? Because he moved upon men to do so. Hence, although men wrote it in their own words, it's still the word of God. Oh, friends, it's an amazing thing because in verse 2, the Bible takes us a little further. It says, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Understand, this is one of the proofs that scholars use to let you know that John wrote the book. Why? Because, in essence, it says, if you would, the word of God. In other words, it's calling Jesus the word of God. Only John calls Jesus the word of God. He does it here, and he does it in the book of John. But here's what I like about John. In this, <laughs> this, is, this is what was just, just, just eye-opening as I was reading, that in essence, John wrote... Revelation before he wrote St. John. Oh, I wish I had a witness in this place. So John wrote what God was going to do. And then he wrote what he did. Uh, uh, in other words, he, he, he lets them know that deliverance is coming. Then he writes the proof in that he already has done it. Oh, friends, we've often talked about how God has already completed in the past what he will do in the future while he performs it in the present. You serve a God uh, that is there from the very beginning and is there at the end. As a matter of fact, the text later on will say that he is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. Now, for those of you that did not, if you would, succumb to some sort of fraternity or sorority uh, in college, those of you that didn't join this may not mean a whole lot to you, especially if you were not in Bible or in some sort of Greek class. But simply put, Alpha, if you would, is 
the very first letter of the Greek alphabet. And omega is the very last letter of the Greek alphabet. And oh, if you would, Jesus is saying to us right now uh, is that before the beginning began, I was. That before anything ever started or, or began to even come into existence, I already existed. He told them before Abraham ever was, I am. Not that I was, not that I will be, but I just am. Wherever you look on the continuum of time, Jesus just is. He's always going where he already is. He always just came from where he's already going. You can't be anywhere and not see God. God is always there whether you like it or not. That's why he says I'll bring every work into judgment with every secret thing whether it be good or evil because you cannot hide from God. It's an amazing moment because, if you would, it's the testimony of Jesus Christ. In other words, Jesus testifies in this book uh, about what he's going to do for us. But verse 3 says, Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. So the Bible says that the time is at hand. That in essence... The end time has begun. John is writing these things knowing that Jesus is now in heaven. It's an amazing thing every time I think about the testimony of how they knew Jesus was in heaven. The truth is, is that Stephen was being stoned. And while he's being stoned, before he dies, while he's being stoned, he looks up into the heavens. The heavens open. Hold on. It's one thing to look up in the sky and see a star. It's one thing to look up and see a planet. The boy is able somehow to get some kind of vision where he can look through space. He can look inside of heaven, look inside the most holy place. He can see on the throne Jesus Christ. He can recognize him. He sees holes in his hands. He sees, if you would, the scars all over his brow. And if you would, he declares in that moment that Jesus is not sitting down, but Jesus is standing up. That in this moment, he's standing up and he's on the right hand of the Father. Our oh, friends, I need you to understand uh, that that same book of Daniel, if you would, says there's coming a day when Michael will stand up. Uh, understand that when we will be under our greatest duress, under our greatest pressure, that you should understand then Michael is moving on your behalf. What am I talking about? Even in the health nugget, I heard that in essence, if you would, you have to remain in the present. And some of you are too busy worrying about the future, too busy worrying about this coming year, that you have forgotten that God has kept you for a whole lot of years. As a matter of fact, some of you God has kept for 10 years. Some of you for 30 years. Some of you for 60 years. You can say amen. You can say amen when I get close to you. Some of you for 70 years. Some of you for 80 years. Some of you for 90 years. How dare you doubt what God might not do in 2023 when he's already done everything for you all of your life? It's an amazing moment because if he did it before, he will do it again. If he has protected you all this time, then I think he can hold you down in 2023. Oh, friends, uh, stop worrying about tomorrow. Let tomorrow worry about itself. Focus on what Jesus is doing right now in the present. He is focused on you. It's an amazing thing because if you would, verse 4 and verse 5 take us into a different mode. But I need you to just pause there just for a second because I need you to understand that the Bible says in verse 3, blessed is he that readeth. Okay? I'm going to come back to that because that's actually a beatitude that we're finding in the book of Revelation. Now, there are seven beatitudes that we find in this book. Here's what it says, though, in verse 4. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him, oh Lord help us, which is and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Ah, take me back to four. I need you to understand 
that in essence, John to the seven churches, and you have seven spirits. Now I need you to understand that in essence, throughout the book of Revelation, there are a whole lot of sevens. Uh, it ain't just seven churches, seven spirits. But in addition to that, we have seven stars. Lord, help us. There are seven trumpets. Come on now. There are seven seals. Come on now. Seven angels. Come on now. Come on. But not just that. There are seven last plagues. And if that's not enough, you should understand that in these last days, the great controversy that will end this world will all be centered around the number seven. Yeah, you see, seven is the, is the mark of completion. It's a divine number. It's God's number. And you need to understand as the people of God, as you are determined in these last days to keep the seventh day Sabbath holy, that it will become the issue of major contention. That in essence, uh, the whole world uh, will be pressured uh, to worship on a day that God has not set up. Hold on a second now. I need you to understand. And we'll get into this a lot later as time goes on. But you should understand, and you, Revelation brings it out so clearly, that in essence, stay with me now, the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the devil actually has a counterfeit for everything God does. So we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, the devil has his own trinity. Yeah. The dragon himself. Huh? The earth beast and the sea beast. Oh, let me make it clear. Let me make it clear. That in essence, if you would, the devil's trinity consists of hmm, the dragon himself. Stay with me. They have similar qualities. Trust me. Trust me. We'll get to that later. There's a lot of similarities that line up. The devil wants to be God, if you would. The earth beast wants to try to mimic, and the earth beast and the sea beast, they want to mimic both, the, if you would, the spirit and the sun. But understand this, that the earth beast and the sea beast are two beasts we find, if you would, in Revelation chapter 13. Oh, Lord, help us. That, that in essence, the devil has his own trinity. I'll make it clear. That's my job to make it clear. So you have the dragon, the devil. Come on now. And you have two beasts in Revelation 13. Huh? You have the first beast of Revelation chapter 13, which is the Roman Catholic Church. Oh, Lord, people are afraid to say this stuff. Uh, and, and the second beast is the United States of America. Lord, help us. So you have the dragon, the devil, joining hands with, if you would, the Roman Catholic Church and the United States of America to make every man, woman, boy, and child on earth worship on a day that God has not set up. Oh, oh, and they got the power, and they got the money, and they got the know-how. And the truth of the matter is, is that left to their own doing, uh, they could wipe out everybody. They could wipe out all the Adventists. They could wipe out all the Sabbath keepers. They could wipe out all the Judaizers. Everybody that wants to keep Sabbath holy, they could wipe out. But there's a problem. You see, the Bible says that he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High God shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Understand, when they're chasing you and when they're looking for you, they have to ask God permission just to find you. Because his, he covers you with his wings. And under his wings shalt thou trust his truth shall be thy shield and thy buckler. Understand, the devil can't do anything anything to you without God's permission. <laughs> when something comes your way, that's why you ought to bless the Lord at all times. Uh, huh? You ought to be still uh, and know that he is God. Uh, you ought to praise him uh, and trust him because the angel of the Lord does what, Sister Cames? Uh, and kept round about them that fear him. And what? <laughs> and delivereth them. Oh, taste uh, and see uh, that the Lord is Oh, uh, man, how many of you believe that God is good today? Friends, I need you to understand, John says to the seven churches, grace be unto you and peace. Why is this important? That even though we're living in the most expensive country on earth, which gets more expensive by the day, 
I, I, you, you're afraid to go sleep because when you wake up in the morning, the prices went up 20%. You're afraid to go to the grocery store. You walk in there with trepidation. You're afraid to buy a tomato because by the time you get home, it might already be spoiled. You're afraid to go shopping. You don't want to buy too much because it might not last. You're afraid in your own country to live in this place. But I need you to understand uh, in the midst of all of that God has promised grace uh, and peace oh come on now your grace and mercy uh, has brought me through uh, I'm living this moment uh, because of you uh, I just want to thank you uh, does somebody here want to thank Jesus today uh, oh uh, somehow Rice tastes pretty good when it's all you got. Somehow, high ho crackers taste pretty good when it's all. Come on, somebody knows what I'm talking about. Take them high ho crackers, put a little peanut butter and jam on them. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my. Understand, God is not limited to money. God wants to bless you right where you are. Oh. Truth of the matter is, sometimes he lets stuff to be taken from you because you didn't need it in the first place. <laughs> Got to send the worst economy on earth to get nonsense out of your hands. Oh, it helps. Got you putting down stuff and throwing it away all because of that. But I like this because he's not just a God. He's the God which was <laughs> and which is <laughs> and which is to come. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> he's the God <laughs> which was. <laughs> Oh, Lord, help us. When you were being formed in your mother's womb, he was. Oh, when your parents needed to be formed in their mother's womb, he was. But it ain't just that. It ain't just that. He's also the God that is to come. Oh, one day, church, the Lord is coming. And I need you to understand that it won't be quiet when Jesus shows up. Oh, you better learn to shout in church uh, because it's going to be a loud journey to glory. Uh, oh, you're going to have to learn to shout hallelujah. Uh, thank you, Jesus. Uh, or you're going to look like a nutcase uh, on the way to glory because uh, everybody up there, when they think about uh, the goodness of Jesus uh, and all uh, he's done for them, uh, they can't keep quiet for a second. Uh, they shout it every single time. Uh, and I'm just hoping uh, that when we get to glory, I know we don't want to be biased, but I just hope that Hamilton has a little corner that every time the Savior passes by, they shout, God is my refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Oh, friends, understand, when we get to glory, we're going to shout his praises all day long. Some of you are afraid to say amen in church. What you going to do when the seraphim and the four beasts and the 24 elders bow down and say holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which is and which was and which is to come. Oh, friends, if you don't learn to praise him now, you're going to be an oddball in glory. In fact, we're going to sit you in the corner put you in time out <laughs> we will bless the Lord at all times it's an amazing thing but he's also the God that is it's important to realize that right now he's working out your salvation <laughs> offering his own shed blood that you might be forgiven what the Bible say come on verse 5 verse 5 and Jesus Christ we have the seven spirits take me back to 4 just real quick you should understand, some people get confused. What are the seven spirits? The seven spirits here are symbolic. This is a symbolic number for the Holy Spirit. I think it's very important that he's listed first because he is the representative of God on earth right now. The only member of the Godhead that's present on earth to fight off the devil and all of his stuff is the Holy Spirit. He's listed here first because you need to understand and he's listed as seven spirits, not just because he's about to pour out to all seven churches, but he's also listed as seven spirits to remind us that the Holy Spirit is God. 
He gets the seven distinction of completeness because he's also God. Don't walk around letting people tell you that the Holy Spirit is not God. We have a Father, we have a Son, and we have a Holy Spirit. Three distinct persons of the Godhead. Now, come on, let's keep moving, if you would. Let's keep moving. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead. Oh, Lord, there's so much. I, I need you to understand that the devil got very nervous when Jesus on the cross said, it is finished. Into thy hands do I commit my spirit. Huh? Nobody kills him. He commanded his own breath to leave his body. And don't come back till I tell you to. Oh, Lord, help us. It's an amazing moment because... In this moment, humanity dies, but divinity cannot die, or all of humanity is dead. Oh. Elder Cleveland, when he taught us, he would, he, would, he, would, he would mimic, if you would, that in essence, as they toted the body of Jesus to the tomb, that in essence, uh, if you would, God the Son was walking right behind it. <laughs> that, that in essence, they get inside the tomb, uh, and if you would, he's there. And when he gets in the tomb, they want to make sure that he stays in. So they sent a hundred soldiers to guard. And I tell you this all the time. Whoever the devil puts up against you, you ought to understand God allows them to come so that they can witness your deliverance. <laughs> Oh, they're there to tell the story uh, about how you got over. You see, you can quiet one or two. It's hard to quiet a hundred soldiers uh, that were there at the tomb. In this moment, if you would, they put a seal on it. They're trying to lock him in. Uh, why? Because the devil understands for the very first time he has a victim that has never sinned. He's got the purest dude that's ever lived uh, that's in the grave. The devil knows the rules. Those who have never sinned need not remain in the grave. And so he said, we got to lock him down because he actually has permission to get up. Oh, Lord, help us. And here's the thing. They lock him down and all the soldiers are gathered around. And the Bible lets us know that early on Sunday morning, oh, Lord, help us, Gabriel was dispatched from glory. You know, we cracked the jokes, uh, but the truth is, is that, you know, whether he was moving too fast or he just intentionally wanted to cause an earthquake, that's his business. Uh, but when he hit the ground, the whole earth shook. Oh, I wish I had a witness in there that one angel can leave glory, hit the ground, and the whole earth shakes. Woo! Hold on a second now, because you got a couple that watch over you every single day and every single night. And I need you to understand that God can dispatch two of them on your behalf. And when they hit the ground, all of your enemies get shook. All of them get shaken apart. Why? Because the God God you serve doesn't just love you so much, he will protect you to the very end. It's an amazing moment because he hits the ground. Huh? And the other angel that was watching over Jesus rolls back the stone. And the angel doesn't say to Jesus, get up. He says, come forth. Because can't no angel wake up his maker? Oh, Lord, help us. That in essence... A created being cannot wake up the creator. And so in this moment, uh, the only one that can wake up the creator is himself. Oh, I wish uh, that in essence he comes forth from the grave uh, by the power that's already in himself. Uh, hold on a second now. Because of this, he's the first begotten of the dead. Because he got up, a whole bunch of people got up. Woo! Bible says a multitude uh, arose with him. Uh, that in essence, uh, not only that, when the time for him to ascend to glory from Mount Olives, there was a multitude that went up with him and they were praising God and singing his praises. Uh, to the extent the Bible lets us know, they got so caught up, they weren't paying attention to the gate. And the gate was shut. You know, angels have a sense of humor. <laughs> you know what? Let's keep the gate shut. <laughs> 
because if we keep it shut, they're going to tell us to open it. <laughs> Oh, and sure enough, when the angels stepped from their praises, they noticed the gate is shut and they began to cry out. If you would, from Psalm 24, they say, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. The angels carrying, or the angels on the gate said, Who is this King of glory? As if they didn't know their maker. Who is this King of glory? They said, The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord understand up in heaven they make up reasons and scenarios to give God praise <laughs> Woo! you only want to praise him when there's money in your pocket uh, you only want to praise him when things are going well uh, you only want to praise him when the cupboards are full but up in glory when nothing's going on <laughs> they make up reasons uh, just to shout his praises up uh, oh if you could just get up in the morning when the cupboards are empty when there's no money in the bank, when your kids are acting trifling up, when things are not well at home, and still get up and say, I will bless the Lord at all times. I'm going to shout his praises. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us sing his praises. You understand? Up in glory, they praise him for absolutely no reason at all. He's just God, and he deserves our praise. The prince of the kings of this earth. It's amazing because the text uses this language, which is what the devil offered him on the mountain. You can have it all. But Jesus refused to take a shortcut to your salvation. He says, the only way I can truly redeem him is with my shed blood. The Bible says, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Verse 6. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Let the church say amen. amen. <laughs> Verse 7 <laughs> brings us to the very theme of the book of Revelation. This is the theme right here. <laughs> Behold, he cometh with clouds. And every eye <laughs> shall see him. <laughs> and all kindreds of the earth shall wail <laughs> because of him. Lord, help us. Verse 8, <laughs> the Bible says, I am what? <laughs> I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, said the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come. We've talked oftentimes about how God has already completed in the past what he will do in the future while he performs it in the present. It's the same God that says, I'm the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Before I created the world, I died for it. But I need you to understand when the Bible uses the language that he redeemed us with his own shed blood, that the actual word that's used there, oh man, is a very powerful word because I need you to understand it's simply the aorist participle. <sighs> that in essence it was an action that began in the past that ended in the past that redemption occurred at Calvary's cross and when it occurred it was complete which means there's nothing that you have done that he hasn't already died for <sighs> there's nothing you have done in your life that he hasn't already forgiven Oh, Lord, help us. It's up to you to accept the forgiveness, but it's already forgiven. Now, you can accept it or you can reject it, but it's already forgiven. And I need you to understand that in the midst of all this craziness, in the midst, if you would, of the false trinity persecuting God's people, that the Bible lets us know that Jesus is going to stand up. And I like the text, and I like to read it, because in essence, in 1 Thessalonians, if you would, chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse, if you would, 13. It's a text for those of you that attend funerals all the time. You know it very, very well because we read it almost every single time. The amazing thing to me is that other churches when I go to in this country and all around the world that are not of our faith, they read the same text. I don't understand how they read the same text and come up with a different conclusion. But here's the Bible says, but I... When I'd have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, Lord Jesus, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if what, church? For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, will God do what? Bring with him. 15 says, for this we say unto you. 
by the word of the Lord uh, that we which are alive and remain uh, unto the coming of the Lord uh, shall not prevent them come on now uh, which are asleep stay right there on 15 I need you to understand uh, that you need to get ready if you see Jesus coming in the clouds of glory you ought to learn to do some jumping jacks real quick <laughs> because the Bible says uh, if you happen to be standing on top of somebody, you're going to have to get out the way. Because the Bible says you won't be able to prevent them which are asleep. For the Bible says this in verse 16. It says this very clearly. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. And what everybody? And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Come on now. Verse 17 says, then we which are alive and remain. So you got to wait for mama to go up. You got to wait for daddy to go up. You got to wait for your grandparents to go up. You got to wait for that dead spouse to go up. You got to wait your turn. You got to see the second coming. They are just coming out, if you would, from a deep sleep. And the first face they will see is Jesus Christ in all of his glory. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. Oh yes, we believe in the rapture. Woo! Oh yes we do. We believe in the rapture. Oh, it's okay. I, 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 I knew you Pharisees would get real quiet. We as Adventists believe in the rapture. Huh? Oh, I'm saying it again. We as Adventists believe in the rapture. Huh? We just know that it won't be a secret. Oh, for the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And in case you're still sad, the Bible says, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Oh, friends, when the trump of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. When the morning breaks, eternal bright and fair. When the sacred, when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Oh, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, make sure you're there. Make your calling and election sure. Understand that yes, you may be sad, yes, you may be depressed, but weeping may tour for a night there's a morning that's coming uh, soon we will see a cloud about half the size of a man's hand uh, and the closer he gets the brighter he gets until it lightens the whole earth ride on King Jesus uh, let no man hinder thee ride on King Jesus get yourself in order in 20 and 23 because he is coming God bless you Get you to stand for our closing hymn. When the roll is called up yonder.
I know you were blessed today. Yeah. Pastor, what a powerful word. Yeah. And reminding us that Jesus is coming. Amen. The revelation of Jesus Christ, folks. We are started a new year. But let's look forward to the end when Jesus will come to claim his own. Amen. Let us pray for the benediction. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy that you bestow upon us. We thank you for the songs that were sung and the word that was preached and the reminder that you are coming. You're coming to claim us as your own. Be with those who, who have been laid to rest, the families, Lord. Give them the comfort and the peace that you have given to us. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May, his, may he turn his face towards you and give you his peace. Let the church say amen. amen. Sing along as we sing, bless this house.
years. Uh, perhaps you didn't quite finish high school and you're ready now to take that test. You can get your high school diploma. You can earn a GED right in this place. For those of you that may be hungry, that may be short on food, feel free to come by every Wednesday afternoon. Our community services department is more than willing to give you plenty of food, a nice hot meal, and maybe some extras that you can take home and bless your family with every single Wednesday afternoon. So come on over. There's much more. We don't want to just, if you would, feed you spiritually. We also want to help with some of those temporal needs that you have in your life. So come and join us, not just on Sabbath. Come and join us during the week. We're willing to work along with Jesus Christ to do whatever it takes to make sure that your needs are not just met down here, but that one day very, very soon, you'll be ready to see Jesus when he comes into the clouds of glory. Until next time, may his peace be with you. May he watch over and protect you until you make it again into this place, into this space, whether it's virtually or in person. Just know that here at Hamilton, we love you dearly, and we can't wait to worship with you again. God bless you, and have a blessed and happy Sabbath.